So this is part two of a video that I posted on September 3rd called Ben Shapiro Doesn't Understand Anything. I've uh, linked to it in the description, but if you want a quick refresher, here you go. Ben Shapiro is a moron. Good. Now that we're all caught up, we can proceed. After a word from our sponsor. Vikings War of Clans is a strategy game modeled after the best strategy games of the 90s and early 2000s like Warcraft. There's over 20 million people playing this game because it strikes a great balance between being super immersive and also something you can just play casually on the toilet or even during, shall we say, a, a romantic tryst, you know? If you have a forgiving enough partner anyway. Let's just say that if Vikings existed in 1998, Bill Clinton would have been playing it on top of his desk while other things were going on down beneath. And if you uh, need more reasons to play Vikings, there's a big drone giveaway happening on October 5th. If you're a level 10 or above, you can win a DJI Spark. And if you reach the highest level of the game, you can win a DJI Phantom. The contest will be held on Friday, October 5th in an Instagram post in Vikings uh, page. And uh, you can find out more information about the contest plus download links to Vikings War of Clans down below. So support my channel by downloading Vikings for free only from my links in the description box and get a special of 200 gold coins and a protective shield. Don't forget to look me up and join my Vikings clan under the name TJ the Destroyer. <laughs> Speaking of TJ the Destroyer, let's do what we came here to do and destroy ourselves a little Ben Shapira, huh? Now, I consider myself a nice guy. What? Why are you, why are you laughing? I, I really do. Anyway, I've, I've done several nice things. Like, one time, I saw a school bus uh, careen off a cliff, and uh, all the kids died in a horrific fireball, and I made a valiant effort to stifle my laughter. So I, I feel like that qualifies me practically for fucking sainthood. I am a bastion of moral virtue. But for this video, I'm going to take the Alice Cooper approach of no more, Mr. Nice Guy. So Ben Shapiro, welcome to my nightmare. What have you got for us now on your list of seven myths of democratic socialism? Fourth argument made by proponents of democratic socialism is that it's never really been tried. Now you hear this one a lot, right? The USSR wasn't socialist. Venezuela wasn't socialist. Cuba wasn't socialist. None of these countries have ever been socialist. It's just like magic. The minute they start sucking and blowing away dissidents, then all of a sudden they're not socialist anymore. It's what we in the, in the commentary business call the no, it's called the no true Scotsman fallacy. This idea that it's never been tried. It's just never been, and if we tried it perfectly, then it would totally work this time. Wow, Ben, I don't really know if you want to encourage your audience to learn about logical fallacies, because if they learn too much about them, that's going to undermine everything you've got to say. Like, you're a well-poisoning ad homming, straw manning, slippery sloping, question loading, question begging, burden of proof shifting, special pleading, fallacy riddled piece of fucking shit. And we all do logical fallacies. I mean, we're human beings, but you're like a fucking fallacy dispenser. Put a coin in your ass and a, fa a fallacy will come tumbling out of your mouth. Oh, did I say fallacy? I meant phallus. Oops. For example, uh, this argument you make here, total straw man. I don't know why I did it like that. I just, that's, that's my artistic vision, my autistic vision. For example, this argument is a total straw man. Uh, first of all, you're still failing to acknowledge that socialism, which is a post-capitalist political philosophy, is not the same as social democracy, which is just well-regulated capitalism with a robust social safety net. Someone saying, let's eliminate all private property and socialize the means of production is not the same as someone saying, let's keep capitalism but regulate and tax it enough to afford a stronger social safety net for the poor and the middle class. And the willful ignorance you display in disregarding the difference between these two positions fundamentally undermines everything you're trying to say here. I mean, the entirety of your speech is built on a straw man fallacy so big and so glaring that you might as well replace your 20-minute speech with a 20-minute loop of, if I only had a brain, 
With the thoughts I'd be thinking I could be another Lincoln if I only had a brain. But you don't, Ben Shapiro, no, you don't. How did I miss my fucking calling as a singer? That's what I want to know. Mm. None of the people you're calling socialists now are pointing to the USSR or Venezuela as models to emulate. Although, your characterization of Venezuela is bullshit based on jingoistic American conservative talking points. The reality is that Venezuela's economic woes are largely the result of U.S. meddling and that the policies of Hugo Chavez had many good results for the people of Venezuela before the U.S. sabotage. He took unemployment in that country from 14.5% percent to 7.6 percent infant mortality rates nearly were cut in half extreme poverty went from 23.4 percent to 8.5 percent oil exports went from 14.4 billion dollars to 60 billion dollars during his tenure illiteracy was virtually eradicated from the country the average lifespan increased by two years child malnutrition went down by 40 percent etc at fucking cetera now obviously a lot of this progress has been erased for Venezuelans. Why? Because of the failures of socialism? No, because of the numerous U.S. sanctions that have been levied against Venezuela in the last four years. We've levied four different sets of sanctions against them since 2015 at an average of one a year. Uh, That's the reason Hugo Chavez is revered as a hero by the vast majority of the people of Venezuela. It's not because he fucked them over and brainwashed them. It's because their quality of life was never better than it was under him. Now, none of this is to say that Venezuelan-style socialism is wonderful or that it's right for America. No. But what I am saying is that the Venezuela that you and your conservative buddies rally against is a fiction that ignores the facts. You're painting a caricature of what Venezuela Venezuelan socialism is, and unfortunately, the corporatist left in America has helped you paint it, including the disingenuous twerp John Oliver. For a really detailed examination behind the reality of Venezuela, I'd recommend the video Leftist Debunks John Oliver's Venezuela episode by the channel Empire Files, which is a channel far to the left of my own, by the way, by a person far to the left of me, but a person who will bring up facts about Venezuela that are ignored in this country by the right wing and by the mainstream left. Not that any of this matters even in the slightest, since politicians like Bernie Sanders and Ocasio-Cortez don't don't support a Venezuelan style system. But I love undermining this stupid Venezuela talking point that both sides of the aisle are ridiculously fond of. Now, as for the USSR, they were totalitarian in their approach to socialism, and authoritarianism is not a great thing on either side of politics. Just look at the Nazis or Mussolini for examples of some right-wing authoritarianism. And for the idiots who will inevitably point out that the Nazis were national socialists, right there in the name, I'd have to point out that the core tenets of their ideology were nationalism, anti-immigration, racism, and a disdain for social democrats and communists. It should also be noted that the Nazis, when they took power, did not dismantle capitalism, but rather made it uh, capitalism subordinate to the state. Now, I'm not saying that Trump supporters or American conservatives are Nazis, but what I am going to say is that Ben Shapiro is closer to a Nazi than Bernie Sanders is by a long shot. Does Bernie Sanders believe in strong nationalism? No, no. But Ben Shapiro does. Does Bernie Sanders want to stem the flow of immigrants? No, but Ben Shapiro does. Does Bernie Sanders support racism? No, and as far as I know, neither does Ben Shapiro. Uh, Does Bernie Sanders despise social democracy and communism? Well, I don't know his opinion on communism, but he is a social democrat, so he obviously doesn't despise them. We know Ben Shapiro, on the other hand, hates both of those things. Does Bernie Sanders want the state to control capitalism? Yeah, he does, and Ben Shapiro doesn't. So if we look at the core traits of Nazism as being nationalism, anti-immigration, racism, capitalism subject to the state, and antagonism towards liberal democratic values, then Ben Shapiro exhibits three of those core tenets, and Bernie Sanders exhibits only one. Now, you have to exhibit all five to truly be a Nazi, but one thing is for sure, the American right exhibits a lot more than the American left by a country mile. The key message here is this. Authoritarianism should be opposed, whether you pair it with a right-wing or a left-wing ideology. It's just bad news. The fifth claim the democratic socialists make, and this is the one that you're going to hear the most often, is that what real democratic socialism is, it's not Venezuela, it's not Cuba, it's not the USSR, it's Norway. 
Norway's their favorite one these days, right? It was Denmark a few years ago, and then Denmark had an economic collapse and elected a right-wing government. But now, <laughs> but now it's Norway. Norway is just awesome. As I say, even the, the prime minister of Denmark started objecting to this. In 2015, Bernie Sanders was going around talking about how Denmark was just the best place ever. Uh, I guess that was another place he wanted to mooch off a commune and then get kicked out. Uh, and the, uh, and the, the Danish prime minister went to Harvard Kennedy School of Government and he said, quote, I know that some people in the US associate the Nordic model with some sort of socialism. Therefore, I would like to make one thing clear. Denmark is far from a socialist planned economy. Denmark is a market economy, okay, which is true. If you look at the Heritage Foundation ranking of economic freedom, what you will find is that the United States is ranked 18th, ranked above the United States in economic freedom according to the Heritage Foundation, right? Good conservative folks, okay, ranked above them. Denmark is ranked 12th, Switzerland is ranked 4th, Sweden is ranked 15th, the Netherlands is ranked 17th. So all of the Nordic countries that the left likes to proclaim are socialist are in fact actually capitalist, meaning they have low regulation and they have free trade and they are great places to invest your money. Right? All of these places are prosperous because of capitalism and the economic problems that they have had are largely attributable to the giant welfare states that they've built on the back of capitalism. The truth about using socialist systems on top of capitalism is that capitalism creates the strength and then socialism freezes things in place and redistributes everything, which inevitably tends to suck the strength out of the system. Right? You have a growing system that is, that is really bursting at the seams with potential and then people say, well, we're rich enough, let's redistribute all the gains. So they do that, they redistribute all the gains, and then it turns out that people don't have as much of an incentive to work anymore. And this is why you've seen, for example, there have been some experiments. There's one that was shut down literally today in Canada, I think it's in Ontario. Uh, they, they had a universal basic income experiment in Ontario. They shut it down today because it turned out that when you give people a lot of money to stay home and do nothing, they stay home and do nothing. Yeah, those countries like Denmark and the Netherlands do have capitalism and they do, just like our country, bounce back from more left-leaning parties to more right-leaning parties. Doesn't this kind of bolster the case for Bernie Sanders? Because he too is calling for a country that preserves capitalism and preserves democracy. Social democracy, believe it or not, is not anti-democracy nor is it even anti-capitalist. I mean, it seems like Ben Shapiro is making my arguments for me at this point. So let's talk about the logic of all the social Democrats praised Denmark until it became right-wing. There was a financial crisis, and so the social Democrats were thrown out and a center-right party was brought in. Yeah, and the same thing happened in America in 2008. There was a huge financial crisis and the conservative Bush administration was thrown out and the ostensibly liberal Obama administration was voted in. With any economy, there are boom and bust cycles. But if your party is caught holding the, the, the hot potato of the bust cycle, then you're going to lose power, whether you had anything to do with the bust or not. Bush did, by the way. Uh, I don't know if the Social Democrats running Denmark caused their economic bust cycle, but if they did, then they did. Dems are just the facts. But by American standards, how conservative is Denmark's current government? Did they get rid of Denmark's free education for all policies? Nope. Did they get rid of universal health care? Nope. Did they get rid of their extremely generous maternity leave? Uh, no, they didn't. You know why? Because anyone who tried to touch any of those things would be out on their ass in a second. Those programs are extremely popular. Does this mean Denmark is a bastion of perfection? A utopia? Of course not. This is Earth. And the Danish are still human beings. It's challenging to pay for all those social programs. It's difficult to sustain when population growth is stagnant. And yes, taxes there are very, very high. Anyone who presents to you a utopian ideal is full of shit. Every system is going to have problems. But to me and others who think like me, the problem of how do we sustain a welfare state is a much better problem than how do we morally justify our criminal levels of poverty our untreated sick, our uneducated masses, our stagnant wages, etc. Does social democracy weaken capitalism? Yes, in the same way that feeding the hungry depletes food. What good is a strong economy if it doesn't serve the people of this country? What good is a strong economy if its strength is not applied to helping common people, but to pressing a boot heel against their necks? What good is medicine if you can't afford to take it? What good is capital if you cannot afford to invest it? What good is any resource if we're told that we're not allowed to use it? 
Okay, the sixth claim that is made by a lot of these uh, democratic socialist advocates is that socialism works in medicine. This is their other big one, is that America's system of healthcare sucks. And if you go to some of these socialized medicine states that we, even if you don't claim that Canada is, is a socialist country, they have a socialized medicine system and it works better than our system. So first of all, it is important to note that the United States system of medicine is not actually a free market system. The American system of medicine is deeply, deeply regulated. Heavily, heavily regulated. As some of you may know, my wife works in this industry. Okay, it is. <laughs> Government programs have exacerbated this problem in many ways. Medicare has low rates of reimbursement, high levels of paperwork. More and more doctors are opting out of Medicare, which means that they are upcharging other customers in order to make up for that lost time. That is raising prices. The fact that there is no transparency between your insurance company and you is a real problem. No one in this room could probably get a straight answer if you walked into your doctor's office and said, I want an x-ray, how much does it cost? You literally cannot get a straight answer. The healthcare system in the United States is absolutely a free market system. To say that it's not because it's regulated is stupid. By that standard, there's no free market economy on earth. All markets are regulated, and that's a good thing. You wouldn't want it to be legal to sell arsenic as a candy. You wouldn't want it to be legal to make the brakes in your car not work or fail after 100 miles. You wouldn't want it to be legal for a company to sell you sunblock that makes your skin you know, break out in lesions. Regulation is good. It's one of the best things about having a government in the first place. And if I believed in any sort of God, I'd say, God bless regulation. Our healthcare system is a for-profit system wherein insurance companies, drug companies, and doctors are all looking to make money off your illness. If you have a cough, this might not be that big of a deal. But if you have a heart attack, this could mean going hundreds of thousands of dollars into medical debt. In fact, nearly one in five Americans have delinquent medical debt on their credit reports. Because of this dog shit system, one in ten adults will delay medical care, uh, fearing that it's going to cost too much. They'd rather save money than go to the doctor. And who could blame them? But enough of your feelings, Ben. Here's some real facts about our healthcare system. We have higher rates of medical and lab errors than comparable countries like Canada, Sweden, the Netherlands, Germany, and France. And though Canada has a higher wait time than the U.S. to see a doctor, you can see a doctor faster in Germany, the Netherlands, Sweden, Australia, France, and the U.K. We have a higher rate of death due to preventable disease than New Zealand, the U.K., Germany, Denmark, Canada, Italy, the Netherlands, Sweden, Norway, Australia, France, and Switzerland. And the fucked up cherry on the shit side Sunday, we spend more money on health care than any of those countries. We pay more than any other country, in fact, mostly because in those countries, the government negotiates medical costs. In our country, we leave it up to the free market. And the free market does what it does best. It extracts profits. Even Ben Shapiro admits this. And the fact is that virtually all medical innovation truly is driven by the United States because we are not a government that bargains with drug companies we're not a government that bargains with surgeons. And so what that means is that we pay a premium, right? We're actually paying the actual free market price for medical care. And then all these other socialized medicine co countries are basically jumping on the back of what we pay. So we're paying more so that other countries get to pay less. Then let's do what they're doing, you asshole. If our system is being exploited by, like, by every other fucking country on the planet, let's change our fucking system. It's like we're playing a different game than they're all playing, and we're wondering, why are we losing? They're playing the better outcomes game. We're playing the more money game. That's fucking dumb, Ben. Democratic socialists claim that capitalism is a giant failure, and this, of course, is the stupidest argument of all. They talk about how capitalism is evil, capitalism is terrible, capitalism impoverishes. To believe this, you must have been dropped repeatedly on your head as a child from a very high height. And you, you fell off the stupid tree and you hit every branch on the way down to believe this. <laughs> capitalism is the greatest success story in the history of humanity. People living on a dollar, or a, dollar a day or less fell from 27% of the global, the global population in 1970 to 5.4% in 2006 an 80% decline. Poverty worldwide included about 94% of the world's population as of 1820. In 2011, it was only 17%. Mortality rates for kids under five declined by 49% just from 1990 to 2013. Virtually no American lives in poverty by global standards, right? Poor people in America are still rich people every place else. Capitalism is the greatest single force for lifting people out of extraordinary suffering that has ever been devised. 
It is not close. And you can look at tables of life expectancy. You can look at tables of, of survival of birth. You can look at, at wealth tables. Basically, most of human history looks like a flat line, and then you hit about 1820, and suddenly things start to move up, and then you hit the, the 20th century, and suddenly things skyrocket. Right? The fact is, if you took somebody from the 17th century, forget that, if you took somebody from 1910, and you dropped them here right now, that person would think they died and went to heaven. They really would. I mean, because my babies can expect to live eight decades. Right? Nobody lived eight decades. My, my, I can right now pull out my phone and get any piece of information that I want and order a pizza. Right? I can, you, can, you can literally do anything now. Things that people thought, like the, the greatest luxury that people had in 1920 was a flush toilet. Right? I mean, like the, the greatest stuff that they had, there was, like the really, really rich guy had air conditioning. Everyone has air conditioning. Nobody had a microwave, nobody had a cell phone. Right? The, the middle class, the, lo the person who is poor today in the United States has a microwave, a car, two TVs. Right? That, that's, that, that is a demonstration of, of how successful capitalism. Socialism is people living in abject poverty. Wealth is not created by socialism. Suffering is created by socialism. Once again, the philosophy you're arguing against isn't anti-capitalist, so you're wasting your breath. But for the sake of argument, let's examine your statement there. You talk about how capitalism has lifted us all out of poverty. Well, as we discussed in the last video, tons of people in America still live in poverty. And by the way, capitalism is by no means the only variable in the equation here. Are we forgetting about a little something called the Industrial Revolution? I mean, you can argue it was driven by capitalism, of course, and you'd be right, but it's not capitalism that improved those lives. It was technology. And to make the mistake of thinking that the link between them is inexorable is lazy and wrong. In fact, if you want my prediction, and I never said you did, technology will eventually create a post-capitalist society. Not in my lifetime, most likely, but at some point, if we have technology that gives us complete mastery of weather and energy and matter, then we will no longer need an economy based on constant growth and the scarcity of resources. But whatever. I'm getting into the purview of futurism here, and we should stick to the present and the near future. Technology and capitalism are not one. They are two separate forces that have worked in tandem, but neither is contingent on the other. And if one is contingent on the other, it's not technology on capitalism, but capitalism on technology. You also talk about how a poor person in America is rich anywhere else. Well, no. For a single person, the federal poverty line in America is $12,060 a year. If you look at average incomes across the globe, you'd have to go to number 40, Costa Rica, to reach a country whose average income is lower. The poorest American could be about average in Costa Rica. Not the poorest, but the person at the very top of the poverty line would be about average in Costa Rica. But their income would be absolute dog shit in Sweden or Iceland or the Netherlands or the United Arab Emirates or Japan or France or even fucking Greece, a country with serious economic turmoil. So that's just not a true fact, Ben. And uh, that concludes Ben's video, so let's summarize. Ben Shapiro is a paper tiger who wields a sword of ad hominems to slay a straw man. In other words, he's a fucking joke, only no one is laughing. Nothing out of his mouth is even the least bit thoughtful. He speaks authoritatively on things which he does not understand to eager crowds of people who are somehow even dumber than he is. And even most of them don't look impressed. To describe him as a sniveling rat would be an insult to the noble rat. Rat. Frankly, I'm going to take a break from him for a while. I don't see any further merit in addressing him. So the only question now is, who's next? Does anyone know of any other cretinous morons who are given way more influence than they deserve? Our favorite! Oh, shit! Going to need more than two parts for that one. I'm the Amazing Atheist. Peace the fuck!